Cause you're listening to Jams and Tea You won't see the show on your TV So we talk about things musically Cause you're listening to Jams and Tea You're listening to Jams and Tea Welcome, everybody, to a brand new Record Club episode of the Jams and Tea podcast, where we ask one simple question. Where are the dope boys at? We are going to be talking to, talking to, talking about this week. We are talking about my recommended record. We are talking about Brockhampton's Ginger for multiple reasons. One of which being we have covered on this channel the entirety of Brockhampton's career up until this point. I have reviews for Saturations 1, 2, and 3 that are all a couple minutes long that you can watch if you want to. And we have a previous Record Club episode about... Ooh iridescence which is more than a couple of minutes long <laughs> which is more than a couple of minutes long but still very much worth your time and we talked about the fact that there have been sort of like vague buzzings about a new Brockhampton album being on the horizon we were just like yeah what we got to do is we have to review Ginger for like a record club right before then and we didn't expect the announcement to happen and then Kevin was just like yo new album in two weeks and we were like oh okay sorry, I mean sorry ghosting yeah it's just like we will don't worry my love we will we will talk about you another day but we we moved this to the forefront because we wanted to talk about it sort of like this last little final note right before next week we get roadrunner new light new machine so uh this is an allow me to set the stage a little bit uh this is also a brockhampton album that alongside iridescence does come with a slight bit of baggage albeit not nearly as much but uh even iridescence as lukewarmly as it could be received by some corners of the internet generally considered to be their weakest effort uh a year later um they had actually started dropping singles pretty early on in the year. I remember, I think, uh, If You Pray Right, was that was, the, was that the first one? The first one was I've Been Born Again. Oh, I've Been Born Again. Uh, they started dropping singles. I think they dropped three before the album proper came out. And um, they were just, you know, sort of building to it. And there was just sort of this omnipresent looming question on everybody's mind, which was, what are Brockhampton going to do next after Iridescence? Because there was that whole deal with them changing the album, with them scrapping a previous album, and it's just kind of like everything was so completely up in the air. And I think that when sort of Ginger came out, it was a bit of a sea change for the sort of world of this band in regards to their relationship with their fans. Uh, Ginger is, uh, in essence, a far more... I will say that it's definitely a more pop oriented record and some people do have kind of a problem with that even though since day one Kevin Abstract has been adamant that Brockhampton's basic intent was always to make pop music uh, and in between Ginger and Iridescence he also released a solo album uh, which was very good and got some a little bit of uh, buzz around it sort of like tided the fans over until they were ready to start releasing for that uh, and then the album dropped and uh generally i think it is considered to be uh, a step up from iridescence in a lot of ways i don't know exactly a lot of people who would say that they think that it's better than their favorite saturation entry but i've seen enough of them uh and it's generally considered to be a good record but there just sort of seems to be a lack of a general consensus on it just because reactions weren't exactly split as much as they were different levels of varying positivity i suppose i, I think i can speak on that a little bit yeah um, go ahead as well is that um this one of the, the attributes of brockhampton um or the attribute of brockhampton that i think um endeared them so immediately to a lot of people in 2017 was the kind of rawness and the immediacy of the music that they were making then it was very fun it was very bouncy it was very um colorful colorful and immediate um and i think that ginger has elements of that um i think actually that the brockhampton boys they take great pains to make ginger as diverse a record as possible in terms of incorporating all these elements of their classic sound as well as a new direction but it is overall a less immediate record in the way that the saturation records were and it is um and it follows a trend that um really became apparent with iridescence of uh the record mostly being focused around this really heavy introspection 
and that was obviously an element of the saturation records too but obviously it was there was a, there was a more carefree fun atmosphere to those records and i don't think there's certainly elements of ginger and iridescence that are fun but i don't think that's the primary adjective that comes to mind for really most people when you think of them they are much more dour records at certain points uh, a lot of in fact almost exclusively the verses on these records and um, let's focus on ginger specifically are uh, again, more introspective, more inward looking, um, often um, conflicted and um, sad. Uh, and, and this is also in tandem with the embracing of this boy band label that the, that the group um, sort of gave themselves around the time of saturation, actually, that kind of came out the gate mm -hmm. wanting to embrace this title. Um, Best boy band since One Direction. Exactly. But it, 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 in many ways, in those early days, it felt more like a flourish um, or a way of like trying to uh, give them a kind of unique um, per perception um, from the outset. It didn't really feel like what they were in a certain sense, in, in terms of like the cultural attributions of, of the term boy band, until you get to Ginger, where it feels like they are trying to take those elements of what made them so catchy and fun and, and impulsive and, and awesome and trying to imbue them with more, I, I guess I, for lack of a better word, more singing, um, yeah. more kind of um, pop attributes of pop music as opposed to rap music, despite the fact that there is rapping all over this thing, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, and so they, they treat this interesting line on Ginger where it is, I would say more of a pop record than any of the records that precede it. But at the same time, it feels more like, it feels like classic Brockhampton in a way as well. So it, it's like the same, but different. Um, and I think people maybe just because we're just talking about perception at this point. Yeah. I think maybe where people fail to get on board with Ginger is they expected a certain kind of record based on the singles, which I think the single suggested a more rap heavy than pop heavy record. It did. Then as a matter of fact, Kevin, uh, like this is also a, a great indicator for uh, a, a very important thing with Brockhampton. And that is literally never listen to anything Kevin ever says ever, because he's almost certainly lying. That being when he dropped, like before the singles were even done dropping, he was just like, yeah, we're making a, uh, uh, like a summer album. Like that's what Ginger's going to be. It's like a lot, like heavily inspired by Outkast is what he said. And um, while elements of that certainly do make it into Ginger, that is not the attitude of the overall record, like at all, I would say. Like it's just not representative of it as a whole. No, it, this is um, a, a winter record of anything, or maybe like, yeah. a, maybe like a fall record or something. I, I it is immediately oh. dour. Uh, I think with as soon as you get into No Halo and, and it continues in that mood and, and if anything it doubles down on it in the second half of the record as well mm -hmm. um, so yeah I think perhaps what Brockhampton's weakest attribute is is that um, in some respects they're amazing at marketing but in other respects they don't really give seem to be giving a heck of a lot of thought to marketing either like they're, they're um, good at getting themselves out there and letting you know who they are they, in they, terms of like packaging a, a product in a way where it's like a full album cycle that makes coherent sense yeah maybe maybe not yeah and it's like i, I actually did this this week i sat down and thought to myself because i experienced the ginger rollout in real time uh, i remember i remember it vividly every step of mm -hmm. it um, and I was trying to sit down and think, to them, okay, if I was, if I, if someone handed me this album and said, pick the singles, the order of the singles and how you would do them. I actually started to realize that, you know, I probably would have ended up doing something similar to what they did. It's yeah. this weirdly interest. It's this weirdly strange record where the pop tracks are so dour, so downbeat, so sad that it would be difficult and to choose them to market the record if you're trying to make a successful record. The one exception, I think, is Sugar, which is still kind of has a melancholic tinge to it, but would have been an amazing pre-release single. But I think the, a version of it leaked, and so the band were dissuaded from actually releasing it as a pre-release single, which I think was a mistake. Um, you sh they should have stuck with that. That's the only um, thing I would have changed is I would have um, released Sugar as a single at some point. And it, and it didn't even matter because Sugar became the band's biggest song over the course of like a month. Yeah, and that's yeah, like, an example let's of... Let's have a, have a look here. 
Yeah, uh, give me give me a number. One, the number one most streamed song on Spotify of theirs is Sugar with 326 million over that 326 Ooh. million streams. And Damn. the number two is Bleach off of Saturation 3. And how many and is that? 168 have? million. Okay. That's, that's like that's half. Like, yeah. yeah. So, so the about. whole the whole sugar thing was was um it was great that they grabbed onto the momentum of that and they built on it with two different music videos and a remix and and all the sort of stuff. Leaper. Yeah, all the sort of stuff that came after the record and that was a great way actually of maintaining the longevity of the album in some form in the public consciousness. Um, but people make up their mind about records long before you have this post album thing. Especially people, with the this band. People make people want to yeah. make up people want to know whether Brockhampton are hitting or missing for them and they want to know it quickly. That's why this band has so many leak tracks and people obsess uh-huh. over the leak tracks and stuff. And yeah. so this yeah. is why this sorry. I just this is why I can't really like fault them for anything that they did because i think people were going to be stupid about this record no matter what They're, yeah so i think kind of no matter what i think what they did was actually pretty smart with sugar uh, by playing the long game overall because uh, pe- people are going are just looking to be upset about something with this band and have for years now and i don't think there's really a way to please everybody or I mean, sometimes I feel like there's no way to please anybody with this band, really. But I don't know. I can't. I can't really fault the process here. Yeah. No, you make a great point. I think with just the eclectic nature of this band, and them being like this full-blown creative force that just consists of so many different people and so many different ideas, that it's just kind of like this sort of messiness is kind of inevitable in some way, especially mm-hmm. if it hit along the wavelengths. But like, like iridescence in a way is that I feel like a lot of like all this stuff I think we're talking about is super necessary to understanding um the album the response to the album and a lot of its content but I also think it's important that like we take which we will like I'm not saying that we wouldn't uh but like we do with iridescence is that there is just so much to unpack about the actual sound of it divorced from all of these things that I feel like it gets like unfairly overlooked or unfairly maligned in some instances just because the music seems to be at like the back of the conversation with them all the time which is like the only thing that really matters when you get down to brass tacks so boy do i not know how to unpack that yeah i i don't much care for that but that being said i think that it's not exactly going to surprise anyone that all four of us are pretty tremendous fans of of this album i don't feel like we've all had any changes of heart as of recently as to whether uh or not we uh dig this and um just because i never really stopped listening to it is what i discovered (laughs) You, you you might be on to something like I that the first thing I did when I found out Roadrunner was gonna happen was I fucking listened to all of the the albums over again um but uh I won't go into just because I think this discussion is probably going to be a bit more conversational considering uh we know these songs really really well um yeah. But I will say I'm going to tell a, a brief story, as I am off to do, that they, that my podcast mates, no doubt uh, have heard me tell dozens of times to f- them around to experience it. But it is also important uh, for understanding my feelings, understanding Serge's feelings, and even Morgan's feelings. Uh, that being uh, the fact that the album rollout was happening and it was going over the summer. Uh, I believe it was August when it came out. August, September, yeah. something like that. Uh, uh, second yeah. August. It was yeah. yeah okay. It was August, uh, and at the time, you know, I was still a tremendous Brockhampton fan. I'd already gotten into Iridescence, and I was listening to Arizona Baby. Morgan was basically like I had gotten him uh, into the band too. We were. I remember talking about the singles, and it was just like they dropped. Um, no Halo was sort of the last single they dropped before the album, and I remember Morgan texting me once that dropped, and he was just like, "Yo, this is the one. I am." In. I'm here for it, and I was just like, "Yo, let's go!" Yeah, All right, through, cool. Through tears, so just like, <laughs> yeah. <"This is> the one. <laughs> and <laughs> so it's just it... from, from my own perspective. Like just before this record came out, uh, I hadn't really listened to Brockhampton. I think I'd heard of. I don't even think I'd listened to any Brockhampton. And then a few weeks before, what I think you're going to talk about in a minute, yeah. um, I listened to 
Arizona baby, and I cannot remember why, but that was like a spiritual experience for me. I'm sure I had something to do with that some on some <laughs> level. What? Uh, what? But yeah, like th- that, the, the entire rollout that year of uh, Brockhampton stuff was so fucking like that 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 was so intrinsically tied to that period of my life i was just like yo all right cool let's let's fucking let's do this and you know i i I remember just sort of like getting to know halo which is the the only dour single that they kind of had and just listening to that and it's just so blanketly hard on sleeve the the song that it bears the most resemblance to would be saturation one's milk i would say in a lot of respects um just sort of a circle of them going around in this really confessional way uh to this like really really downbeat instrumental and it was just like okay i really just don't know what to expect with this and as luck would have it for the last six months uh we had been planning to meet each other in real life. Me, Sersha, Morgan, and our friend, Davey. And it was, you know, like, that's a pretty big important thing. Sersha lives across the ocean and Davey lives across state lines and Morgan and I are here. So we just, you know, we, we did all our plans, did all that stuff, yada, yada, yada. But uh, the day, the day before Sersha got to the airport and I went to go pick her up in Cincinnati, Ginger, leaked so what do i do i download the leak i put that shit on my phone because i've been listening to the singles basically non-stop since they came out and i was like okay perfect timing i can drive to the airport throw this on my car stereo for its first listen and fucking like perfect ideal way to experience it so i was just driving on the interstate i threw on this album and basically on my my way to pick up a friend I've had for years but never got to actually meet this album intrinsically tied itself to one of the most meaningful and important experiences of my life uh the over the course of those next couple of days where we all just hung out if we drove anywhere some song on Ginger would be playing. Uh, I remember If You Pray Right played as we went to go get uh, Blizzards from Dairy Queen. And Morgan, I remember you distinctly uh, joking around being like, hey, remember when I said I really wasn't into this song? I was a fucking loser. Because <laughs> it has... It's got some... It just got some farty-ass horns on the beat and I lost my sense of humor that day. I don't know. And then we put it on the radio and we were just like, yo, this knocks. So basically that entire, like the entirety of Ginger just became the soundtrack to that whole week where we, you know, we went around, we watched movies, we went places, we went to Morgan's, we had stoned watching movies. We, we, we just, we had a glorious summer experience and it was, it was weird and tumultuous too like we had like we all got drunk and watched cabin fever and we all got kind of sad the remake feelings the remake the the remake the i think that movie was so bad that it it ushered in an existential crisis that ended with a lot of us crying that night but that's neither here nor there but this album basically there, there was an emotional tenor for every single song on here and i remember when Sergio left uh, and like it was a couple days after Davey had gone, Sarah left and I just put this on when I was driving back from the airport to uh, my house after we had listened to, I think, a tape of Simon and Garfunkel's greatest hits on the way there. Um, mm-hmm. But then uh, Morgan and I came back and then I went out for a drive and I put on this and it was like listening to a completely different album, uh, not because my opinions on it had changed, but because I just like listened to it and once it hits sugar where one of the lines is you know spending all my nights alone waiting for you to call me it just had a bit of a resonance that a week previously it did not have and it became this weird bohemian youth thing and the fact that Brockhampton are who they are those weird DIY ragtag group of weirdos just sort of that there is a kinship that connected here and the introspection of Ginger lended itself to that and I think the one important thing that they carry over from Iridescence which is an album that sounds virtually nothing like this at all um is the approach that Tyler said to the verses the introspection is that that is 
everywhere here. Not to say it wasn't on the Saturation albums, but they doubled down on it. And they doubled down on it hard and they doubled down on it consistently. And that's why I think this record's really good. But I have more in-depth thoughts as to the track list. I don't know if anybody just wants to kick off like a discussion talking about each song or if we just want to fucking well, ramble, but... Uh, I don't have like... There specific... is something I, I want to just add as a coda to your story, if that's right. Hmm. Uh, because I came to you guys and I was so basically impressed at how much you guys knew about music that, that week as well as being one of the most magical experiences I've ever had, was the real impetus for me to start taking music more seriously. And listening yeah, to that was stuff. around when we started to talk about music more than I think might have been like the core impetus for a lot of us to start the music chat that began this very podcast. It was like <laughs> this moment, and then it was Tyler and I talking about Great Grandpa's Four of Arrows. Like those two moments spawned us sitting here talking about this right now yeah um so i don't have uh actual notes on this record i try to write notes but every time i put this record on i just um i can't i just have to listen to it it's so stupid because i can write notes on records i love but i just i maybe it was the fact that i was like burnt out from uh, writing about the other records that we discussed in our new releases episode for this week but um but i do know this record deeply well probably about as well as jake does uh it's barely cracked my top 20 for 2019 but yet it was probably the album that year that i listened to the most or one of the albums that i listened to the most certainly mine because it is most compulsive it is just compulsively listenable from front to back i one thing i do want to say at this point and i think this is an opinion that i'm the only one here who here who will have about brockhampton is i don't think that they have made or will ever make a perfect album um and i think that's fine um, yeah. because they are a messy band they're messy by yeah. design they have so many different um personalities that it's a frankly already miraculous that they don't constantly clash all the time and i think it's a miracle that they have released as many records as they have while still remaining intact i think that the holding together of this group of friends by the seams um, especially after all that they've gone through and especially after the dramatic um, year they had in 2018 uh, it's just a frankly a fucking miracle that this album exists and, mm -hmm. and a record was bound I think a record because of how relentlessly creative uh, and just the fact that these people express their pain and everything through music I think there was bound to be a record in the wake of the Amir thing so iridescence was bound to happen in some form or another the record mm -hmm. like that but I think Ginger is um uh, iridescence is just like a raw howl of of just pain and 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 confusion is one of the emotions that comes through on that record more than anything else it is i understand why people find that record difficult to get on board with i understand why people find that record troubling because it is very uh abrasive and we've discussed that at length but i think ginger is the record where uh brockhampton really reckon with who they are reckon with what their purpose is as a group now not what their purpose was when they began i think that um mm -hmm. brockhampton managed to make the most brockhampton record without losing sight of all of the things that have shaped and changed them since they first became uh a ha famous for being brockhampton um they have gone through so much and they've experienced so much that would that should by all rights have torn them apart completely and yet they managed to hold together and make ginger which i think is uh probably one of their most focused records uh, and i don't think it's i think it's actually frustratingly close to perfect um but i yeah. almost respect the fact that it's not perfect a little bit more because the uh, yeah the, the the one of the few things that holds it back is that um, even though the idea of a 12 track Brockhampton record uh, fucking fills me with excitement, uh, it rather it filled me with excitement uh, upon the announcement, uh, because I think that's a perfect, a contained burst of, of, of Brockhampton. It's exactly. And there's no skits or anything for the first time in the band's discography. It's just songs. Yes. Although there is Heaven Belongs to You, which I will, yeah. I will 
it was the kind of the point I was getting at where I think yeah. this is um, this is my least favorite Brockhampton song <laughs> uh, ever. Uh, and I just, it's just what because. You mean, I ain't green like Tim Seed. It's just because. Sweet your chimneys. It's not even that. It's not even that I dislike slow tie because I don't dislike slow tie. I, uh, I, in fact, at the time that Ginger came out, I enjoyed slow tie quite a bit because it was, I believe, not so very long I. after his first record. Came Nothing out. great about Britain, which was yeah. really good. Yeah, but I find him to be obnoxious as hell on this track. I just cannot listen to Fair. it without getting annoyed. Um, and it's like he's he's kind of trying to make he's kind of trying to be smart at certain points and and poke fun um and then it just feels like at a certain point that he just kind of gives up and says you know a whole lot of shit and some bitches and i'm like what's your point my dude and i get that it's the oh god thing. i'm a dog backwards and my other gripe uh and this is a less of a gripe and it's and it's a different kind of gripe and that's simply that um and it's one that probably if you're in the brock Hamlin fan base you've heard a million times already and that's that why this track didn't lead into if you pray right i have no idea why <laughs> why you decided because this track wasn't conceived alongside that track those two track the two track titles of those tracks are a direct reference to a nina simone song and they perfectly oh. flow into each other yeah, there's a Nina Simone song called um, Did not know that Called Heaven Belongs to You If You Pray Right um, Well, that God damn so, it <laughs> And I kind of I kind of get the reasoning Of putting St. Percy in there Because it kind of does flow into If You're a Pray Right in its own way But it also just completely Has the record It jaggedly cuts into the record It's not a bad song I like St. Percy quite a lot But it just jaggedly cuts into the record at this point And I think that it kind of encapsulates why, again, on a surface level, the messiness of Brockhampton as a unit and just as a concept puts can put people off and has put people off when they when it isn't backed up by the immediacy of Brockhampton as this exciting new thing like they were in 2017. The messiness and the jaggedness of what they are and what they do can be jarring in a way that you does require a little bit of patience, I think, um, to fully get on board with and I think this little bit of bizarre sequencing early in um, Ginger is in tandem with the strange choice to uh, seemingly hide the deep pop proclivity of this record until the release of No Halo just days before the album came out are two reasons why um, Ginger is perhaps and the whole ginger rollout and everything is perhaps frustratingly close to perfect, but also messy in a way that's clearly deliberate and I can't necessarily always fully get on board with. But that all said, that's basically the, I, that's me starting with the criticisms and that's really all of them. Because I think the rest of this record uh, front to back is ex excellent. Um, I, it's always battling for me but, but with um, Saturation 3 as their best album again another record that I personally think is frustratingly close to perfect and just needs one song yeah. and the skits to be cut and it's just a what song do you would you want cut on Sat 3 I'm curious to know if it's the same one that I would cut Stains really interesting I think the one I would cut is Hottie oh no I love Hottie Hottie's great um, never did much for me but yeah Different discuss discussion for a different day. Yeah, um, sure. Anyway, um, yeah, so so anyway, Ginger is this kind of perfect encapsulation of Brockhampton and it does that in a, in a package that I think is much friendlier overall and more cohesive than Iridescence, which I still like, as you'll know from uh, my review of that record. But mm. yeah, I think that this is basically, the, the best tracks on here are basically the best possible version of the boy band vision that Brockhampton have been searching for um, since their inception. Really? This notion of being a rap group that nonetheless have this kind of dynamic um, variation in what the, their talents are and what they're able to do. And mm. I think that is perfectly encapsulated by the place of Bearface on this record. Oh. Um, so Bearface Fuck. has always been this fantastic voice um, and he's, he's added this great um, singing quality to Brock Hampton's music and he continues to do that here but he also starts flexing his rapping muscles and no one's going to call him one of the better rappers on the record no. but I think he does an 
he does a commendable job and his decision to kind of branch out in that way is a perfect encapsulation of the ways in which Brockhampton are trying to unify all the different varying aspects of their sound into something that feels more cohesively like this single group of people uh, in sync with each other. Um, and I think that's one of the greatest aspects of Ginger is that they're unified around doing that and that you can have songs like Boy Bye, for instance, which is just this great absolute um, pop rap bop that just goes at like a 150 BPM or words yep. per minute. And it's just Dumb awesome. Dumb is on 2x speed. And you, yeah, and, My you can God. Have that, and you can have that on the same record as a, tr a track like Love Me For Life, for instance, which is much more slowed down and withdrawn and sad. Um, and, and these kinds of things can coexist within the same record and not just feel like, you know, Brockhampton are throwing their best ideas at the wall, but Brockhampton are crafting something that feels ho holistic. And, and that's really uh, what I think the greatest success of Ginger is. And I'm particularly partial, and this is a, maybe a more of a, an outsider opinion, maybe not in this group, but certainly in general from what I've read, I'm particularly partial to the second half of this record. Particularly, oh, very much so. In particular, the final four tracks, which I think oh. is, is one of the best runs of music on a Brockhampton record, consecutive runs of music, and seems to be one of the most overlooked sequences of music in terms of um, what I've read about their critical reception. Yeah, at band. least people with iridescence seem to be like, yo, those last four songs are fucking great. Whereas with ear, it's just kind of like, oh yeah, like when was the last time you heard anybody talk about Victor Roberts? Because I just fucking have it. I just want to say for a about six months after this came out, Victor Roberts was my favorite Brockhampton song. It was all I would talk about when we talked about Brockhampton. Wonderful so, pick. So, so weirded out that no one else yeah. wanted and, to talk about this thing. And like, that's the thing, like I heard everyone who talked about that track talked about how amazing it was. And then in general, it still seems to be slept on. Um, but anyway, what I love so much about this final stretch of four tracks, I think that if it were its own EP, it would be one of my favorite EPs ever. It certainly has, yeah. it feels like a, its own little mini album within the album. Um, and I think maybe some people have complained about the fact that these songs, that's why they don't like it, is that these songs feel like they're out of step with the rest of the record, which I don't agree. I kind of no. see you're it, gonna tell I, I me, agree. You're going to tell me like Big Boy doesn't sound like the rest of the album. Are, are you going to well, do no, that? I, I do think I, I'm there, not talking to you. I'm talking to... I do think there is a specific tone to the last four tracks on the record that is much more consistent within itself than, than the tones of the other tracks, maybe. Um, with the exception of something like No Halo, which also... Works. That's just the journey that it takes you on. Like, despite the fact that I actually have the same problem sequencing-wise with you do with the record, is that that's the thing about their albums, is that, for better or worse once you get to a certain point you've heard these albums enough it becomes impossible to not hear these songs in the order that they are and I feel like that journey is really really present with them always and it's always been building from every single record and they've gotten better and better as they've done it and despite the fact that there's a sequencing problem I think Ginger might be the best at it well I'm just gonna I was just getting at a point about the sequencing that I think is what mm. brings this whole record together for me despite the, the complaints I've already had is yes there is a dis distinct tone to the last four tracks that I think is much more holistically sad and um and reflective and moody but I think what's beautiful about putting all those tracks together there is that at the exact midway of this record you have Dearly Departed which is this big centerpiece song um, that is incredibly emotionally fraught uh, obviously the everyone thinks of Dom's verse and the uh, obviously what it's about about being very explicitly clear but there's other aspects and, and topics that are touched on in that song as well Matt on that song thematically very similar and, and equally uh, heartbreaking I, I particularly like Kevin's verse on Dead yeah part of it as well I, I mean think, everybody in that song is yeah, great the everyone, best they've ever been everyone's fantastic in it um, but anyway, that song represents this kind of like cathartic hell that the band have been building towards ever since um, the, the, the first kind of signs of turmoil um, in 2018. And it's a very cathartic track. Um, and then you have I've Been Born Again, which comes after it and is very clearly purposefully placed there, a rebirth mm -hmm. sort of song. It has, what I love about this track, and I, it used to be one of my least favorites, and I still guess it would be if I ranked it, but I, I like it a lot Ditto. more now. Um, mm -hmm. But what I appreciate about this track is that 
it represents a rebirth and yet it is very much a kind of classic Brockhampton sounding song. Like it's the very kind of standard sort of song that would have fit in really easily on one of the saturation records, I think. It's, it's got this real kind of flavor of, of genuine fun and bounciness. Um, and, and it almost feels like it's kind of like, it, it, it's representing kind of the image of this band and their rebirth. And then it's kind of sending you into this, um, new direction with the last four tracks yeah and it's kind of like the first half of this record gives you uh, all of these different flavors of, of brockhampton that you're used to mix them with this kind of new um more somber sound and then i've been born again represents kind of like the turning point where they kind of wave goodbye to that and they fully embrace their boy band sad boy side on the last four tracks i think it's a really great piece of sequencing that um leads the record into this very specific stretch of songs that have perhaps been called boring by some but i adore i i, I love the fact that they are i mean on the face of it they are these kind of slow sad songs that are much more focused focused around um or highlighting things like singing um, but you also do have like incredible verses on these tracks. One of the complaints that I have heard about this particular stretch of tracks is that um, Kevin dominates them to a certain extent, um, with the exception of Victor Roberts, notably, and that he is not at his strongest on, at this particular point in the record. But I disagree. Again, like he's not dropping hot bars in the way he is on a song like fucking. Um, I mean, yeah. Um, yeah, but I, need, he, I need a buzz cut style verse on Big Boy. <laughs> exactly. really oh, he's, no. kind of, he's kind of getting into his feelings in the same way that he did on Arizona Baby. And, yeah. and I think that he, his place on these tracks is this kind of like withdrawn, sad, somber um, person who's expressing these emotions in a way that's much more cool and not cool as an awesome, but like um, chilled and, and sort of withdrawn and then you have other uh and it sets the place perfectly for other members of the band to express the same emotions in a much more in a much louder and more um uh outwardly shouting way like i think of for instance my favorite um verse on this whole album just my personal favorite which is Joba's on big boy that's um, that's mine yes let's go uh, where it's like he's got yeah, Kevin is a bit sleepier on this track and he's, and he's mumbling a little bit and he's singing in a way that's kind of like much more dour and down. But that is just a perfect counterpoint to the energy that Joba brings to the track. And that relationship between the two aspect, the two attitudes or the two expression styles and the fact that they're both getting at very similar kind of feelings is what makes the song so effective. Um, mm -hmm. and, and it's just that kind of they're just so locked in, into sync with each other on this record and particularly on this final stretch of songs that I, again, it's that, that's the aspect of it that really feels so much like Brockhampton coming full circle. And I think what is the ultimate icing on the cake here is the fact that for the most part, they all kind of just step aside on the final track and let a guest rapper come in uh, and quite pointedly, um, deliver a, a, an incredibly moving and powerful stream of consciousness rap which I'm, I, I'm aware is not stream of consciousness it's incredibly well written and stuff but it's this moment um where despite the fact that they're all so in sync with each other together they know um they are so confident in that and and they're so at this point of comfort that they are not afraid to kind of step aside completely and and see the floor in the final moments and i find that quite moving um, and I, I, I find it to be kind of like the ultimate realization of uh, this whole like feeling of universality that people see in their music. And it's kind of like they're acknowledging that by letting someone else, letting someone else's voice dominate a song aside from their own. Um, maybe that's a bit nonsensical i don't know if that makes sense no but. tyler that's the thing about victor roberts that i that i think is worth noting that i don't feel like a lot of people pay attention to is that like the i have seen some people take issue with the fact that the track just sort of feels like out of place or whatever which it doesn't but the the thing about that i find so captivating about that is that i think that you're on to something but i think the idea of victor roberts as a track of letting someone else speak uh on that sort of behalf is just like 
this to me is a statement. This to me is them saying the pert, like Victor Roberts, the, the guy in question, who's a friend of Dom, who's doing the, the verse here, who's delivering this incredible story about um, uh, cops coming into his home and trying to find drugs that his parents uh, were, were dealing in order to support their family. And I, I just, there's so many like special lyrical passages here about him, like wearing his red Power Ranger pajamas, just so many like little details that make the song what it is. But in like a macro way, I think this song is like, this person, Victor Roberts, this is who we make music for. This is the audience of Brockhampton. People who go through things like this and experience this, and this music is meant to speak to them and speak to an experience that um, that is very much something that a lot of people have gone through and that a lot of people feel abandoned by and that isn't necessarily touched on by a lot of other people because a lot of the stuff that they're doing in these genres is stuff that's like, you know, hip hop has been a genre of, of excess. And I feel like only in the last, like the, the, the previous decade has sort of been like a bouncing back from the bling era of a lot of people coming to reclaim uh, hip hop from a more grassroots kind of situation. Like even people like Kendrick Lamar, you have good kid magic city which is a story about being some young broke kid in compton and having these forces like control you mm -hmm. and then you have victor roberts here and I, I just find that so moving especially that latter half of the track where it's just sort of the vocalizations where it's you know the, thank god still got my bitches still sticking with me and it's like that chorus is so powerful because it's just like it's just reaffirming the reasons that you love their music, that they yeah. love making their music for. It, it, it's just a perfect coalescence of their mission statement with the album. And it's like, so. And what's so perfect as well is that it, it's just this perfect encapsulation of, yeah, like you say, like the fact that um, Brockhampton's music is kind of like, well, one of their modus operandi is to kind of be something that can help people. And I think that yes. is um, encapsulated in Beerface's hook here, which is, if you're hurting, love yourself with my heart. Which... My favorite Brockhampton lyric ever. And that is it. Oh, that, that, is the, that, that is the takeaway from this whole record. That is the whole sort of moment that the whole record builds toward. And that this whole shift of the record into this kind of more introspective, emotional... Um, heavily sad state is kind of getting at is this is this notion of 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 their purpose as a band we started out as this kind of fun group that were making these really this really fun music that allowed people that allowed, we allowed us to express ourselves our sexualities talk about our um you know our demons and that kind of stuff then we went through hell and now we're making music that is trying to go to those people that we initially connected to with that fun stuff that we did and tell them that we kind of you know understand the the shit that they're going through understand the pain that they're experiencing and and our own, even though we've experienced a very unique kind of pain it's 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 just a statement about the universality of that and just about how Brockhampton's renewed purpose in this era is to be this um, vessel this life raft to people who can see the hurt and the depression and the betrayal and all the shit that they've experienced and can see that they are able to turn it into something beautiful and that they are able to um yeah just that and I, I, you 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 touch on something that we haven't mentioned yet which is important, I think. And that's the fact that Ginger is a record that is primarily about healing. You have Iridescence, which is this, you know, that primal rage screen that you talked about. And I think there's like, I'm glad you mentioned that lyric on Victor Roberts, because I was going to say that in the same way that the lyric that defines Iridescence is private plane still crashed, is that love yourself with my heart is the definition of this record in the way that that lyric is that one. But yeah, also- I think, about the, I think about the two records like, the movie The Exorcist, right? Iridescence is like the the ex the you know fit of panic and rage, and then this is the like expulsion of all of that. You know that those to me are sort of the the ways I relate to each album is that this is the the is is that, and the best example of it for me is Dom's verse on Dilly Departed, where he 
just lays everything on the table and you can hear him get up and slam the studio door as he leaves. And it's, he it's, gets big mad. Yeah, like what, what's the line he says? It's like you can tell it to God, but I don't want to hear it. It's just yeah. Oh. I don't want to do motherfucker. Yeah. And oh, can I, I, I need to po- I need to point out um the very end of that song, which fucking undoes me, like b- because of a very intentional production choice, is that right after Dom leaves the studio, you faintly in the mix hear these guitar tones, this dun 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 dun, dun, dun. that's um, uh, Sunny from Saturation 2, a song that is primarily remembered because of Amir's verse. And it makes me die. <laughs> that is a great detail as well. I think it's also worth mentioning on the note of that track too, um, the music video for that uh, is I think uh, one of the most sort of significant of this era mm-hmm. um and and obviously if I, I i'm sure that if people are listening to this they've probably already seen it um but it's just this beautifully unplanned unfiltered expression of the song that climaxes with um dom giving a, a, a physical equivalent of the verbal uh emotional intensity of the actual song and it's um it's difficult to watch. It's really difficult to watch damn it. the music video for that song, but mm. I think it complements it well. And it's a bold and brave decision to do a music video for a song like that. And I think it highlights the importance of the song for the band and um, the importance of needing to express um, certain sentiments that are expressed in the song. And I think it's also meaningful that that music video functions like a therapy session. There's the framework of it. Like um, they're all sitting on a couch and each of them is kind of like um, giving their verse one by one, not a therapy session, more like an intervention actually. Um, and it's like, mm-hmm. and it's like they're giving an intervention and this unseen person that they're talking to or people that they're talking to are the person that they're trying to reach out to. Um, and I think that, is a really beautiful summary of, of um, one of the darker sides of this whole framework of the record being like reaching out to people uh, except this time it, it's kind of trying to speak to something that represents a darkness uh, you're the demons you're trying to overcome and and it's 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 intense yeah mm-hmm. um dilly departed for me is one of my favorite songs on the record um i have like i mean I, I could pick any song really except for a couple and be like this could any day be my favorite on the record except from like uh victor robertson sugar which i think is like a perfect song i think sugar is yeah. like a perfect pop song and again dom's verse on that is, is etched into my brain <laughs> mm. um it's just incredible for, for me i like i i could just i could do his whole verse right now but um, I especially like the, the line where he says, we're, we're constantly looking for God and never see it in ourselves. And I think that's just really beautiful. I'm rambling, move on. Um, well, you point out a very uh, recurring theme on the record, which is the search for God, which is ultimately like, it, it's just sort of like alluded to on a song like No Halo, which, you know, we, we've kind of glazed over that a little bit, just kind of like, you know, it's very emotional song. No Halo is like, one of the best Brockhampton songs. I, I mean, good god damn. I, I was um, I, might I, say the best. I, I was <laughs> about to I never somehow never got around to saying this when I was speaking before, but it is my favorite Brockhampton song ever. Joba, 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 Joba. We were talking about how iridescence was like him coming into his own, and he just consistently, every single time he pops up on this album, he is just like the best thing about it. If everyone on No Halo gives some, some of the best performances they've ever given Mm -hmm. uh when dom comes in i literally get chills like full body chills when he comes in there's just like he he it's already a really sad song like you can tell the tone of the guitar and and the tone of the hook which is really kind of despondent um but there's just this energy still an energy shift when he comes in from despondency to genuine despair and it's so fucking moving and and just Oh, I, 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 I cannot bear it. 
it, it's amazing. It's the best Brockhampton song by far for me, which is saying something. So I'm a huge fan. Um, and I think it's a yeah. really significant song for them and a perfect choice to open this record. And the vocals yeah. contributed by Deb Never are... Uh, another oh thing my God. Think, another thing worth saying, the, con- the contributions, with one exception for me, across this record from outside mm. voices are really inspired, <laughs> inspired in terms of choices um, and, and just knowing how to take certain voices, particularly voices that people are largely not familiar with and placing them in a way such that they don't just feel they're in there to give that person a voice but they're in there because that person belongs in the song and the energy they bring to it the emotional nakedness they bring to it is just exactly what the song needs um and and i think that is um, one of the reasons why the regular contributions of Ryan Beatty across this record are so integral yeah. to what makes it so appealing to a lot of people is that you have this relentlessly sad album, but he brings the hooks to it. He helps elevate oh, a lot of the God, hooks yes. as well. Like Sugar wouldn't be what it is without his hook. And so uh, it's just a really great, this whole record is a really great example of the band in unity in a really exciting way but also their ability to bring in outside collaborators in a way that really is uh-huh. inspired um so fuck yeah yeah i i would yeah, also I was, just I like gonna, to share i was just gonna say that ryan Beatty is like the stealth mvp of this record correct mm. That I would like yeah. to point out Mr. Don McLennan's verse on No Halo, which just, this is some of the, this is like these bars here, just some of the best I've ever fucking heard, which is used to fight all my night terrors. Now I smoke through the dreams. The pressure put me into places where I'm stuck in the seams. They sealed my mouth and said, the only way to breathe is to scream, pop the stitches from society and fall to my knees. I you know what? You know what? Fuck. If you have a bad word to say about that verse, I like, I hope somebody hits you with a car. You know, what, you know what, You're Jake? An idiot. You know what, Jake? I I was so sure that you were going to read that verse out that the last time I listened to this record, I was hearing the words in your voice. That I find that extraordinarily uh, moving, and I can't really understand why I think that. But <laughs> good well, lord, no, no, it's also a great opportunity to talk about the fact that, of course, the instrumentals sound different, but they're so well done on this record. And no halo, like the way no halo starts with a strange modulated uh, uh, sort of middle uh, medium tone guitar. Um, And then halfway through the first verse, you get these clean, very high pitched guitar leads that uh, haven't really been changed coming in doing bum, better bum, better bum. And it adds just so much. Mm -hmm. And then the way that uh, sort of Merlin's hook on it has been mixed, it's just so evocative of a kind of nostalgia and the acoustic guitar work across the board on this record is is impeccable um especially on no halo and sugar but all over the place there's just so many great instrumental choices all over this album and there are also some really risky ones that i think pay off super well most notably and i think infamously is the fucking horn lead on if you pray right which is just the fucking weirdest funkiest thing and it's just like this is something that like Danny Brown would rap over. Like this is just such a strange thing to even try to do. And it's a fucking banger. I, like I am, I have it burned, burned into my head the first time I heard this song. And it was just a hallelujah, holy lion word to Judas. I fucking, yeah, well, uh, like the, oof, the choice oof, to make oof. barely departed this like emotional expulsion to stop the choice to make it like an eight, like an eighties throwback electro soul pop instrumental it is it's just fucking bananas dude yeah <laughs> and saint percy with that bass when it's just like the bow wow bow bow now yeah i love like it the bit, the bit on boy by that goes but a bit a bit but a bit just insane <laughs> mad shit <laughs> It was like metallic hits on uh, Ginger or Love Me for Life too. Just like, oh, I live, I live for it. It just worms its way into my ear. And I'm like, ooh. Also, ooh. Um, something that lots of people obviously, a comparison lots of people obviously made when the record came out, but feels like I should ostensibly make it is that Ginger, the title track, is a postal service song, but done by <laughs> Brockhampton. And that <laughs> so it's rules. better. 
That rules. It's a great song. Uh, I I cannot stand <laughs> hearing the opinion that it's one of the weakest on the record. It is Taylor. awesome. <laughs> it's awesome. Stop it. Good song. I actually wrote down that Ginger to me sounds like like an MGMT uh, early kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, it could be. Uh, little Dark Age too, honestly. Like I could I could totally see that. I um also can we just like the the the, the stealth underrated song here for me is in fact Big Boy. Yes. Which mm. just again you're, do you're, not hear people talk about it. You're spitting. It is it's top three on the <laughs> album for me. Pay you're, me up. you're correct. Stick I, shit. Uh, Make me better. That's another that's another album defining lyric, just the whole like um uh I I think I, I did say Joba's verse on here is my favorite on the record, which is true. I, I I think it's fucking fantastic, just like especially how he comes in and he's so like his voice isn't modulated at all. It's just him. There's no distortion on anything. And he just comes in with the, who the hell am I? Who the hell are you? And it's just, just builds and builds and builds off of that. And then just like mm -hmm. he, the way he is able to change up his flow and like the melody of the words is just like fucking unparalleled. Like this album yeah. proved to me that like, while I think that Dom is the MVP lyricist throughout their entire career in terms of actual delivery, I think Joba's the best of all of them. Yeah, uh, like I think back to the moment in the saturation doc where Joba, confides in Kevin that he's nervous because he, he's not a rapper, he's a singer. And then I just think about every dope verse he's ever dropped. And it's... He's the goat! Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I, I, it's just an extraordinarily moving song. It's just this expression of complete just this this notion of being lost and it's it's also brought up in a really good point in the album too i feel like being between uh the sort of melancholic but not entirely downbeat ginger and uh love me for life is just sort of like another inspired choice of sequencing and it just there's there's so the instrumentals especially on these last four songs that you know tyler's been talking about how great of a stretch this just they're so left field that I think that like, I love this record instantly, but the more I listened to it, the more I was just in love with how much of a left turn all of these production choices were, M much like on Iridescence and how it was so focused on being this chaotic, string heavy, but also glitchy thing. This is focused on being this kind of smooth, sugary, um, but also very like, almost like a hollow sound. And I don't mean that in like a derogatory way. I mean it in the sense that like, it sounds like spacious at times. And then when it goes for bangers, it sounds really fucking focused and locked in. And it's just, it's got grooves for days. It's basically like, sonically, it's the best Brockhampton have ever been. I think it's the most consistent. It's the most fully formed sound they've worked with. And it's just, it just always works. And it's so risky and strange. And that's why I'm so excited for the new album, just because it looks like they're looking to combine this and Iridescence. And from what I've heard, it sounds like they're doing a pretty good job of it. Um, well, I guess it seems like they, I actually kind of, my perception of the new record feels like it's kind of a left turn. It feels like they're trying to make a fun record um, yeah. from what we've heard so far in a way mm -hmm. that uh, I'm not so certain that some of the introspection that we got on Iridescence or Ginger will even turn up at all necessarily, although maybe it will. I'm fine with that personally, because that's what they've been doing and yeah. I would find it refreshing, frankly. And that's the thing, like, what I'm getting at is they have earned the right to cut loose a little bit. And, I mean, I look forward to seeing how they go about doing that. Um, mm -hmm. I Especially think that, because there's going to be two records this year, apparently. Apparently. Um, yeah, sure. Again. Never sure, Kevin. Kevin. Yeah, that's true. Um, we'll see what happens. Wrong. It, it reminds me of... <clears throat> oh, excuse me of something uh, Christian Holden of the Hotelier said after a uh, home and for goodness. And I think, yeah, it was a stereo gum interview. He said, this isn't home number two. This is a transition. You have to find a way out. You can't live in anguish your whole life. At a certain point, the creative decision to have 
a record like the one that we think that we're going to get from them, like a, like a more fun record, becomes an emotional exercise in and of itself in the hate to evoke this, but the mentality of the whole joy is an act of resistance. Like it's, it's them fighting back through all of the shit by saying we can still do this. And I find that in and of itself quite moving. I don't know. I, I haven't said much. I'm just, I'm just here, like, yes, Queen, so true, King, the whole time. Um, <laughs> what are your, yeah, fa- what um, are your favorite parts of the album, Morgan? Yeah, for real. Um, well, I will say, I think Big Boy is the best beat that they've ever made. Ooh, um, good pick. It is just t- tasty. When those, p- when that piano Romeo. sample comes in. Ah. Oh. <sighs> Um, yeah, just a you know, uh, both Joba and Dom and Kevin are all doing some of their best work on that song. Uh, but the mood wouldn't be properly conveyed, and the song wouldn't be what it is without uh, Jabari and Romil's contributions to the production. Jabari, me, buddy. Body, body. Yeah, man, I ain't gonna answer your question, man. I ain't gonna tell you something in the head. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, that's what Dom. If you did, then you'd never like. probably hear from me again. That's a promise, not a threat, man. That flow is just the I, I, oh, yeah. God, please shout break out, it out again. Shout out to Dom with the unusual flows on that song and Saint Percy. Like his flows yeah. on those yeah. tracks are yeah. just so off the wall for him. It's, it's manic, and I respect it. I also, read something. Uh, Joba said in an interview with GQ about uh, Big Boys. I remember when I was writing my verse, I remember smoking an entire pack of cigarettes and pacing and sweating. There are certain times where I'll, I'll feel a fire in my something. That was one of those moments. I learned a ton about myself. I pretty much milked it dry. Uh, there were certain moments where it felt like closure, like an unspoken closure, which I think is what really that last bit is what really gets at the heart of what the verse is is i think i think part of it is like the final expulsion of you know this the mindset that they've been living in for a long time now um and sort of just the the mindset of you can't live in anguish forever and this is the last hurrah of said anguish yeah for just, well, I, I was interested to see what their new so the sound would be, even though the two singles sound very different, you know, that, that was still like the main drawers. Like this ginger felt like the end of an arc. And what they do from here is gonna well, be yeah. weird. And this is something we'll discuss on um, when we review the new record, I suspect. But obviously this new record is coming with the longest gap between um Rockhampton releases. Um even if you take into account the technical difficulties series of singles. Um which I think seems to have informed this new record. I know the one with JP Mafia is going to be on the new record. Um, but uh, what's interesting is that it feels like that this is going to be their, their Roadrunner is going to be their poppiest record yet, it seems. And so um, it seems like they've been kind of working towards that. So like Iridescence and Ginger are these records that, as we've talked about, are kind of swapped in personal turmoil, but they have and Iridescence is this kind of ugly sounding album and then Ginger is, has a similar emotional tone, but it's much prettier and more pop oriented. And so it seems like they've kind of been trying to head in that direction step by step and trying to exercise the darkness along the way. So I expect we'll get the final arrival of that mm-hmm. sound and perhaps a more upbeat and optimistic uh, top subject matter to complement it the victory lap that um, the best days of our lives was supposed to be, but informed by the directions their sound has gone in. Yeah, so we'll see how that pans out. I'm so fucking excited. It shit drops on my birthday. I fucking can't wait. I already pre-ordered that CD, you know it, bitch. <laughs> yeah, the thing about trying to predict the sound of a new Brockhampton, the fuck, that is so white. <laughs> that was, I was gonna say, that's Tyler <laughs> dancing to the, they ain't knocking no more. Yeah, that, that's me doing. That's me doing like, Matt Champion energy. Yep. Yeah. 
aggressive. Go aggressive white boy, white. go white boy, go. Go white boy, go white boy, go. <laughs> Damn, this white boy got bars. I hate, I hate can, high school. Can oh, he say God. that? Kids make me do the if, Fortnite dance. If, if you can see that? my face, if you guys can see my face right now. Oh. Imagining the some thing. flavor of anguish. Mm-hmm. The thing about trying to predict the sound of a new Brockhampton album is that you're, you know, there's 13 tracks on the new one. So essentially what you're doing is you're going to be predicting the sound. You're going to be predicting 13 sounds. Um, I think what what is more predict is the attitude and mindset. Yeah, like if you did it with Ginger, oh, then it would be impossible because those first two singles sounded like one thing and then the third single came along and it sounded like a completely different thing and then yeah, the whole yeah. rest of the album was even more different than that. Yeah, it's and like their ability to remain consistent in sound is really due to the fact that they remain so consistent from a, a mindset and sort of outlook perspective. Um, All right. Yeah. Good shit. A whole lot of shit. It's so- well, uh, on that note, let's move to our favorite tracks and ratings for Ginger by Rockhampton. Um, Jake, why don't you lead us off? Took you a minute there. Yeah, sure. Um, my three favorite tracks on the album are uh, Big Boy, um, No Halo, and Ah, fuck, Dearly Departed. Um, no, no, not Dearly Departed, Victor Roberts. Um, least favorite track is the fucking... Actually, you know, I'll be different and say not the Slow Tide track, because the only part of the album that I really don't, like, enjoy is the um, weird final third of if you pray right where it's just kind of like the kevin being like uh... well actually something cool i can add to this discussion that i didn't know uh thank you genius is that apparently what kevin is singing about in the final part of if you pray right is allusions to amir and so um and his relationship with amir which is something that he then builds on in dearly departed so that was put in there because i know it's different in the music video version yeah it is but it was changed to that outro to lead in specifically to the subject matter of dearly departed so that's another cool um structuring thing that i was not aware of i'll have to listen to that just because i've never been a fan of how long that goes on for yeah it's not my favorite part of the album yeah, that kind of shit pisses me off. Like when it's different in the music video from how it is on the record. Like, it just, just make it one thing. It feels unfinished when you do it like this. Yeah, I, I know there's a lot of artists who do that. And patch it, notes. But I, I give Ginger a nine point five. Hey, nice. hey, who the ladies hey. want to talk about us? Oh, oh. Anyway. I got pipe uh, dreams of crack rocks and stripper poles, of ooh. fucking centerfolds. Ooh, I say willy willy. Are you going to say the next line, Jake? Who was in no. Paris, Jake? Who was in Paris? I say, because nobody want to suck a willy. <laughs> we are just posting. <laughs> Morgan, you're next. Call your mama. Uh, my favorite that was track. Clean. Sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Tony Fatano. Fatano. Uh, no Halo. Uh, Big Boy and Sugar. My least favorite is Slow Tie. Uh, nine and <laughs> a, a half. That's a concept. Track. Yes. <laughs> wow. I just I hate his teeth. You ever seen his teeth? I hate them. They are bad. <laughs> They're pretty bad. There is nothing sorry. great about that. Hey, hey, so my my favorite tracks are No Halo, Sugar, and uh, I'm going to save it to Robert. You ever, you ever smoke a sugar? <laughs> yeah, I'm your house. Sugar. Um, <laughs> I, I'll give you the record a nine and a half, too. Um, did I say my rating? Or did nine I? and a half. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, and I'm I'm literally just Jake as ever because my three favorite tracks are No Halo, Big Boy, and Victor Roberts. 
uh, closely tied with Dearly Departed. Um, mm. Literally mm. my top four. Um, uh, least favorite track is uh, Heaven Belongs to You. And this record gets a nine from me. Oh, okay. Well, that's a three. No, I wonder, I wonder what the standard down. deviation on this one will be. <laughs> it's 0.25. Um, God damn! But that's, that's a nine point four, a nine point four average. Uh, some comparable high, comparable records. Visions of bodies being burned. No one can ever know. And Koi no Yoken. That's <laughs> wow. you know an album's good when it gets ranked upside a, a fucking Deftones album. Well, I mean, let's let, let's just let's be real here. Let's just include August's hypothetical rating and just knock it down about three points. <laughs> <laughs> more or less exactly what happened with iridescence so oh um, yeah no. that's true um <clears throat> dope shit well august isn't here so that's just the way it goes if you're not here okay. you don't count so you're a loser yeah, i hate you <laughs> this is the gyms and tea podcast it's a high rating summer without without august um <laughs> jesus so anyway, this is the, this week's Record Club episode. Go and check out our main episode if you haven't already, where we are covering a bunch of new fucking records today. So uh, mm-hmm. go do that and go watch our other videos, yeah, our other Brockhampton week, stuff. And next week next we're going week. to be covering August. Yeah, yes, it, Mike Oldfield's Tubular Bells, which I'm ah, sure, yes. which I'm sure has a great audience overlap with Brockhampton's Ginger. <laughs> oh, surely, but and it will definitely the include connection. I was about oh, to say yeah, it'll include like, more of Sarah's just talking about The Exorcist because it's the dun 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 dun. dun. Fun fact: the Tubular Bells was a song of Dennis Nielsen, famous serial killer. Fun fact: what? <laughs> <Would> <laughs> Dennis Nielsen, he until recently had the highest body count of any serial killer in Britain. And he Wait, he's... <laughs> Good Lord. David Tennant last year. The way he just recited... Would, the way would be just... like, go be like, y'all, you know that Jeffrey Dahmer was a big fan of Joni Mitchell's Blue. <laughs> <laughs> the way he recited that fact was like, um, like a, like a piece of like trivia about a celebrity or something like Stan Dennis <laughs> Nielsen. Did you know? Do not, please. Uh, anyway, rock over <laughs> London, rock on Chicago, Stan Dennis Nielsen.